Hi, everyone. I'm Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today. I've been a space and astronomy journalist for over 20 years, and this is our question show. Your questions, my answers. Now, as always, wherever you are across the channel, if a question pops in your brain, just write it down. I'll gather a bunch of them up and I will answer them here. But also, we do this show live every Monday at 5 p.m. Pacific time. And so you can come join the live show, ask questions, ask follow on questions and join in the conversation. It's a lot of fun. Now you're going to see codes show up above one of my shoulders. And then Chad's going to make a snarky joke about which one it is. Um, those codes are your chance to vote to tell us to show some love to the person who asked the best question this week. And so this is Bespin to uh, Jay. Congratulations. And the question was, do you subscribe to the Big Bang Theory or do you have alternative ideas? And I think my answer, which is that I am not qualified to have opinions about the Big Bang, um, struck a chord with people. So I thought that was great. So congratulations, Jay, for asking the question, although I don't think that's the answer you were expecting. And I guess, uh, but I'm glad the audience really enjoyed that answer. All right, let's get into the questions. Maggers 12. Hey, Fraser, will the stars in the Andromeda galaxy get younger as it gets closer to our Milky Way? Won't be looking as far back in time as we will? Absolutely. If you could wait 5 billion years you would see Andromeda get closer and closer and closer in the sky. And eventually, it would be like another Milky Way, but more in the sky. And then all of the stars that were part of Andromeda would then be merging. But you would have to wait 5 billion years for this to happen. And so when you see the stars in Andromeda today, you're seeing them as they looked two and a half million years ago which is like a long time for humanity. But it's not a long time for stars. I mean, a star two and a half million years, I mean, the sun was still around two and a half million years ago. When you look out into space right now, all of the stars that you see are still going to be there in about two and a half million years from now. So the people in Andromeda are seeing our stars, and they're roughly the same. And when you think about how some stars can live billions of years, 10s of billions of years, trillions of years for the red dwarf stars. Um, it really doesn't make sense. But when you think about it, Andromeda is moving towards us. And so the amount of time that the photons have to take is shorter than you know, as every second goes by. And what happens is that, you know, the photons are still moving the speed of light. But the wavelength of those photons starts to shift, because the whole galaxy, the photons are moving towards us, and they shift into the blue. And this is how astronomers could figure out that in fact, Andromeda was moving towards us because the light, the average light from the stars in Andromeda have shifted towards the blue end of the spectrum, which tells us that Andromeda is moving towards us. While you go and look at most other galaxies in the universe, and they're generally shifting off to the red, which tells you that they're actually moving away from us. And in fact, only a couple of these galaxies are moving towards us. So but it's not like, you know, I mean, if you're gonna wait 5 billion, anyway, I think I gave the answer. All right, we'll move on. Easy Tiger 10. Question is our solar system unusually isolated at 4.5 light years to the next star? Are most stars at a similar distance from the galactic center closer together? The sun is about 4.5 light years away from Proxima Centauri, which is the nearest star system to us. And on average, stars inside the Milky Way are about five light years apart on average. Now there are some places that are a lot denser. So when you go into globular star clusters, stars get to about one light year apart. And that's dramatically different. When you get down into the core of the Milky Way, stars get closer and closer together approaching that one light year distance. And so this 
density of stars is actually one of the reasons why astronomers think that the core of the Milky Way is not habitable, that the stars are packed together so tightly, that the radiation is overwhelming blasting all the time life would have a really hard time to form. And once you get into the outer reaches of the Milky Way, like out into the rim, then stars get to be seven years of light years apart, eight, 10, 20, they get farther and farther apart. And the other thing seems to be that the stars in the outer rim of the Milky Way are more mineral poor, which means that the planets orbiting them are going to be mineral poor as well. And there's a lot of controversy on that. Like some people think actually the radiation near the core of the Milky Way isn't that bad. You're a light year away. That's like a long way. And that really the big risk of radiation is coming from cosmic rays. And if you've got a magnetosphere, you're fine. And also, it seems that the stars in the outer rim, they may be mineral poor, but they're not like no mineral at all. And now astronomers are finding stars with less and less metallicity. And yet still they have planets orbiting around them. And so this idea of galactic habitability is starting to be more and more of a question. It's kind of like here in the in the solar system, the life finds a way, you know, we think, well, actually, life is on Earth, but you need terrestrial planets. Well, actually, maybe you don't maybe you could just have an ice world where you've got liquid water with hydrothermal vents, and you've got bacteria living around these hydrothermal vents. So the solar system is quite typically situated compared to the other stars in the Milky Way, there are places that are vastly denser, and there are places that are a lot less dense. And then there is this giant halo, which we found out today that I'm recording this, the stellar halo surrounding the Milky Way, it used to be thought that it was probably spherical, kind of like how the Oort cloud is this sphere of icy objects around the solar system. There's this giant halo of stars surrounding the Milky Way. And it was originally thought this was going to be spherical, but now it appears that it's football shaped. So that's news you can use. Sandish D'Souza. Hey, Fraser, have we recorded any death of a black hole? Do we have the technology to see this event? So there's this theory by Stephen Hawking, that black holes can die, that they can evaporate over long periods of time releasing this Hawking radiation. And over time, as this Hawking radiation is released by the black hole, it decreases in mass and as it decreases in mass, it increases in temperature that you're seeing the black hole and as it loses more and more mass, it gets hotter and hotter and hotter, it loses its mass faster and faster. And eventually, it just releases one final blast of gamma radiation, and then it's gone. And the entire black hole has been released back out into the universe. This process happens at extremely long timelines, well beyond the amount of time that it would take for the all of the stars in the universe to be born and die, even the red dwarf stars that could live for 10 trillion years, the black holes won't start evaporating until a time way beyond that. And so the smallest mass stellar black holes will evaporate first. And then over time, you move your way all the way up to the most massive supermassive black holes will have finally evaporated away. And there will no longer be any black holes in the universe. It's expected that this era will begin at one to the power of 40 years. In other words, a one followed by 40 zeros. So like if a trillion is 12 zeros, a quadrillion is 15, it's a big number, right? And maybe it could take one times 10 to the 100 years before the last supermassive black hole evaporates. And so again, this is an enormous number. So no, no, uh, no black holes that are currently in the universe will have evaporated and died in this fashion. But there's this other idea of primordial mass black holes. And these are black holes that could have been formed during the early universe. And unlike the stellar mass black holes and the supermassive black holes, these could be any size at all. They could have the mass of an atom, they could have the mass of a house, they could have the mass of a planet, theoretically. And so as I mentioned earlier on, the less massive one of these black holes are, the faster they're going to evaporate. 
And so it's believed that if there are any primordial mass black holes, smaller than about the mass of a medium sized asteroid, like imagine the kind of asteroid that the DART mission crashed into, those will have all evaporated across the entire universe. And you're every year that goes by the next smallest mass of black holes is evaporates and is gone from the universe. And you slowly ratchet your way all the way up to those first stellar mass black holes in that one with 40 zeros after years from now. And so as I mentioned earlier, they're going to give off this flash of gamma radiation. And so this is something that astronomers have gone looking for and have theorized that, okay, if primordial mass black holes are a thing that exist, we should be able to see them out there somewhere in the universe. Let's look for those flashes of gamma radiation. They've looked, they haven't seen them, but it's not expected they would necessarily be very bright. And it's not expected that it would happen very often. And so you wouldn't necessarily see it. But this was like one idea for what maybe gamma ray bursts could have been, or maybe the background gamma radiation that we see in the universe is these primordial mass black holes disappearing one after the other. So uh, this is an ongoing inquiry. And if anyone ever has like positive proof that they've watched a black hole evaporate, I'll let you know. Big brown sound question, is it more difficult to find a black hole or a brown dwarf? That's a that's an interesting question, because both are actually very challenging objects to find. And the method for finding each one of those objects is quite different. So let's talk about what it takes to find a black hole. So black holes obviously are invisible, they gobble up their own light. And so you can't see them. The only way you can see a black hole is if it's interacting with some other object. The most famous black hole is Cygnus X one, which is located about 7500 light years away from here. It was actually discovered back in like the 1960s 70s. It was the brightest x ray object in the sky. So when astronomers launched the first x ray telescopes into space, suddenly they saw this really bright x ray source because the the Earth's atmosphere blocks x ray radiation. And they worked out that what this is, is this is a black hole, there is a black hole in orbit around a star, the star is feeding material into the black hole, the black hole is built up this accretion disk, it's got these jets that are coming out of it. And it is telling us that the black hole is here. And over time, astronomers have mapped this black hole better and better and better. And actually, fairly recently, we learned sort of they were able to see exactly where the accretion disk starts, how the accretion disk forms these jets, we actually covered this in space bites just a couple of weeks ago. So that's one way that you can find a black hole. The other way that you can find a black hole is through its gravitational interaction with another star. And so actually, this is another piece of fairly recent news, which many of you are probably familiar with. So astronomers look through the Gaia data and Gaia is like my favorite spacecraft. And they were looking at the motions of hundreds of 1000s of stars that were in binary relationships, so they could see these stars as they were wobbling back and forth, because they're in some kind of gravitational dance with some other object. And they were able to eliminate all of them. They were like, that's a star that's got a star that's got a neutron star that's got a, that's going around a white dwarf, because they were able to see the other object in this binary interaction, but they were able to find one out of the 100,000 binary objects that we looked at, where the star was just being tugged around in a circle around nothing. And they were able to calculate that in fact, the black hole is there pulling with its gravity back and forth. Now, the supermassive black holes, you can find them again through their gravitational interaction. So astronomers were able to peer down into the middle of the Milky Way with an infrared telescope and see how the stars move around the center of the Milky Way as if they're like comets going around a star, yet these stars are going around nothing. And when you do the math, when you look at the orbit that these stars are taking, you calculate that there has to be a mass there with about 4.1 million times the mass of the sun. And yet there's nothing there. And so that is a black hole. But then also astronomers back to the Cygnus X one with with the accretion disk astronomers have been able to find active galaxies out there, where you've got a supermassive black hole that is pulling in gas and dust blasting out jets of material, there's a black hole there. So if you want to find a black hole, 
you either have to map the movement of hundreds of thousands of stars to see if any of them are orbiting nothing, or you use a very powerful telescope to search for active galactic nuclei. And those will tell you that or very bright x ray sources here in the Milky Way. And that will tell you that there is a black hole there. A brown dwarf is is a very different object, right? A brown dwarf is a failed star. So it's made out of hydrogen and helium like the sun, but it hasn't gathered up enough mass doesn't cause enough pressure and temperature in its core to be able to fuse hydrogen into helium directly. Instead, it does a form of fusion in its core, where it uses fuses deuterium, and it gives off dramatically less light and heat. But it does give off some heat. And so you can detect these in the infrared spectrum. And these have been known for a few decades now since really infrared astronomy has taken off the most successful brown dwarf hunter was probably the wise telescope, which was really a precursor to JWST. And now astronomers have seen these in JWST as well. And so in order to find a brown dwarf, you need to have an infrared telescope. And you just have to start looking in some cases, you can look around some star, see if there's some kind of gravitational interaction, like you would find an exoplanet. But in other cases, you just scan the sky looking for objects that are very dim, but they're visible in the infrared spectrum, just not very, you can't find them very far. I mean, you can only find them within a few dozen light years of Earth unless you do find them around some other object because they are so dim so faint. And so astronomers are really still getting a handle on how many of them there are out there. So which is more difficult? Well, it's like black holes have a giant impact on their environment, even though they are invisible. And so you can see black holes that are millions of light years away, billions of light years away. And they're very bright, if they're interacting with their surroundings, while brown dwarfs, if you have an infrared telescope, and you know where to look, they're relatively easy to find, but you can't find them very far away from us. So if I like had to choose, I would say a brown dwarf is more difficult only because we know of less of them. If you like my answers to your questions, as well as other things we do at Universe Today, consider joining our Patreon club. You'll get an ad free experience on universetoday.com for life, even if you unsubscribe. You'll get ad free videos, early access to interviews, as well as other perks that are exclusive to our Patreon community. Thanks to everyone who's already subscribed and welcome to our recent newcomers Angel Luis Figueroa, Marcella Hanford, Philip Daga, Danielle Perkins, Robert Renwick, Wanda L. Peace, Kyle Mead. Alex Berrigan, William D. Drain, R. Brian Cooper. Join the club at patreon.com slash universe today. The Frozen Biscuit. Do you have a recommendation for a decent, cheap telescope? And does light pollution reduction tech exist for personal telescopes? Dobsonian. <laughs> I'm sure many people are like, Dobsonian. So what is a Dobsonian? Dobsonian is a type of Newtonian reflector that is relatively inexpensive to buy or even build. And I've mentioned this many times, you can build your own Dobsonian if you want, you can also buy them for, I think like an eight inch telescope you can get for about $500, which sounds like a lot. But when you compare that to other telescopes are going to cost you like 1500 plus the downside of a Dobsonian is they're terrible for astrophotography, but they're great for doing visual astronomy. So what you really want to do is look through the eyepiece and see various objects in your solar system, you want to see Jupiter, you want to see Saturn, you want to see the moon with a filter, you want to look at the sun with a filter, um, then that's great. And if you've got dark skies, then you can go deeper. If you know where things are in the sky, Dobsonian is, is terrific. But I took this question because you asked about light pollution reduction. And light pollution is a big problem. And if you live in a city, then you're going to have light pollution that is going to make most of the night sky inaccessible for you. But the weird part is that you can see Jupiter, the moon, Saturn, Uranus, etc. Exactly the same as a person with really dark skies or almost the same. But the thing is, is then the person with dark skies can then go and see all the globular clusters, all the open star clusters, all the nebulae, all the galaxies, all this other stuff that's out there, all of the faint comets that you can't see because of the light pollution.
The only solution to deal with light pollution is to get light pollution filters for your camera on your telescope. In other words, you can't you can you're no longer in the realm of using the Dobsonian where you're just looking into the sky, you have to switch over to a fancier telescope with a fancier mount that allows you to take long exposure pictures with a camera, and then you put very special filters. And these filters are set to let very specific wavelengths of light through the ones that are not influenced by the light pollution in the sky. And so you take so instead of just being able to take say a color picture of sky, you take say one with the hydrogen alpha filter and that that filter is not influenced by light pollution at all. And so you are taking pictures as if you were in very dark skies. The trick is that you have to take longer exposures. So the short version of this is that there are definitely solutions for dealing with light pollution. I have friends who take astrophotos in the middle of New York City, and you wouldn't know. But you have to spend a lot of money, you have to spend 1000s of dollars to build the get the right telescope, the right camera, the right filter system, and the computer hardware to be able to handle the whole thing. It's pretty finicky. But you can definitely do it. And if you're serious, it's worth doing like it's a, as hobbies go. Uh, to be able to sit in the middle of Manhattan and be taking pictures of the night sky and sharing them on astrophoto of the day is rewarding if that's what you're into. And so I think if you want to get into astrophotography, even if you live in a light polluted area, then you can definitely consider it. J cross, how many Oort clouds will we pass through when Andromeda M31 passes through the Milky Way? 742,000. I don't know. I mean, that's like, like, that's a big number. But it's cool to think about. And so I'm just gonna like throw a bunch of information at you. And then you can decide whether or not you want to actually make those calculations. So the Oort cloud is, of course, this sphere of icy objects that is surrounding the solar system. And we only know of its existence because of long period comets, these comets that show up on these trajectories that take them from the vast outskirts of the solar system down into the middle of the solar system, nearish to the sun, they pass through the inner solar system, and then back out on this long trajectory. And in many cases, when astronomers look at these Oort cloud objects, they are brand new fresh, they've never been to the inner solar system. This is the first time that they've ever done this. And they can be on a journey that is hundreds of 1000s of years to go from the outer edges of the Oort cloud down into the inner solar system and back out again. And when they calculate the orbits, they find that these can go out to 50,000 astronomical units, 100,000 astronomical units. And when you convert that into light years, you're looking at one to two light years away from the sun. And so when you think about how the sun is, say, four and a half light years away from the nearest star, Proxima Centauri, I mean, which is near Alpha Centauri, and if Alpha Centauri, there's two stars there, and if they've got an Oort cloud, in fact, our Oort clouds are almost overlapping. And on average, because the stars are five light years apart, essentially, the Oort clouds are always overlapping across the entire Milky Way. And then we know that stars get closer and farther in the future, there's going to be time in the next few hundred thousand years, one of the glizes is going to be coming within about 70,000 astronomical units of the sun. And this happens all the time, like every few million years, a star will come within 10,000 AU within, you know, not the orbit of Pluto, but but very close and their Oort clouds will pass through each other. And so when we think about the interstellar objects that are passing through the solar system right now, I mean, it's estimated that there are 10s of 1000s of interstellar objects, Oumuamua's, Borisov's that are passing at some point through the solar system, like, when we think about Oumuamua, it just passed through the inner solar system, but it's going to be in the gravitational influence of the sun for another few hundred thousand years before it finally reaches out beyond that two light years that I mentioned of the Oort cloud. So when 
the Milky Way with its 100 billion stars, maybe 200 billion stars, collides with Andromeda with its maybe 200 billion to 400 billion stars, suddenly you're going to have all these stars come together and they're going to be a lot closer. And so for a while there, you're going to have just countless Oort clouds overlapping with each other, countless exchanges of interstellar objects, intergalactic objects, there will be a time when the sun will pass close enough to some star that formed in Andromeda that they will be able to exchange icy objects, comets will crash down on Earth that came from a star that was formed in Andromeda, which is just mental to think about. And that's what deep time gets you. That's what the inevitable future interaction with the Milky Way and Andromeda will cause. And we feel like our sun is this island in the middle of this gigantic ocean of universe. But if you play the clock forward over vast amounts of time, it's more like the sun is on a raft that's bobbing around and getting closer and farther to other rafts. And sometimes those rafts collide. I'm, I'm kind of pushing this analogy too far. So I don't know the answer. But there's a lot of cool stuff that's going to happen between now and the final merger between the Milky Way and Andromeda. Constellation Pegasus. When will the data for Arendelle come in so that we can know what the first class star is made of? Arendelle is a star that was observed in a distant galaxy using the Hubble Space Telescope, and the light has been traveling from that star for 12.9 billion years. It's probably a monster star, probably 50 to 100 times the mass of the sun, very bright. It's kind of amazing that astronomers were able to find to pick up this one individual star out of this gigantic galaxy using the Hubble Space Telescope, which really isn't designed to see galaxies that far away. You know, it's because it's not a far infrared telescope. Now, JWST is the perfect telescope to be able to look at a star this distant. And so I don't know if and when JWST has been tasked to look at this, I would assume that it will. But from what we can tell, this star Arendelle is not the first class of star, the population three stars. And the nomenclature of this is ridiculous. But the sun is a population one star, pop one star. The older stars, the ones that are less metal poor are pop two stars, and the first stars that would ever formed out of primordial hydrogen and helium, those are the pop three stars. And it's believed that they were enormous. They formed out of raw hydrogen helium, they were probably hundreds of times the mass of the sun, but they could have been 1000s, maybe even 10s of 1000s of times the mass of the sun, pure hydrogen and helium. They lived fast, exploded, maybe they formed the seeds of supermassive black holes. There's a lot of mystery here. And unfortunately, the JWST is not capable of directly imaging these first stars, which I know sounds bonkers, like JWST is looking right out almost to the edge of the observable universe, right out to the beginning of time itself, watching the first galaxies come together. And yet, these first stars happened even before that we're talking just really a few million years after the Big Bang, tens of millions, while JWST is looking into the era that's about say 200 million years after the Big Bang, after those stars formed and died and seeded their environment with more material. But there is a way that JWST might be able to see these stars and that is through gravitational lensing. So when you've got a foreground galaxy, and a background galaxy, the foreground galaxy acts like a natural lens to magnify the background object. Of course, we get these Einstein rings, we get lots of really cool gravitational lenses. And now suddenly, you've got a, like another lens that gives you about another 10,000 times magnification. So imagine JWST with 10,000 times additional magnification that theoretically, will get us to the point that we should be able to detect the presence of the population three stars. Now we're not going to see these cool stars just floating in space and 
with stellar flares and detonating supernova, but maybe the chemical fingerprint signature, the spectra will be there in the images captured. So JWST will see a galaxy that is gravitationally lensed by some foreground galaxy and in that galaxy, maybe in the outskirts, it will just be able to detect the chemical fingerprint of those first stars. And we will answer many, many questions about what the first few million years to hundreds of millions of years were like after the Big Bang. But to go deeper to go farther, you need a bigger telescope and you need an infrared telescope that's even more ridiculous than JWST. So I know a lot of people are quite excited about this idea of, you know, Louvoir or the Carl Sagan telescope. But you're going to need a infrared telescope, a successor to JWST that can really peer into the population three star era, like something that's maybe 15 meters, but is a far infrared telescope, that would be terrific. And that would fill that last final gap. And then beyond that, you're looking into the cosmic microwave background radiation, which is like a wall that we can't see beyond. Eklund. Do you hope Artemis will lead to lunar based astronomy such as lunar far side often mentioned in for radio astronomy, but also big optical things? Will those eventually be easier to build on the moon? I think it's really important to separate human space exploration with observatories, like some kind of radio observatory on the moon. Because if the Artemis missions don't stick, if they go a couple of times and they decide they don't want to do that anymore. You don't want all of these really cool lunar observatories getting hung up for that reason. And the reality is you don't need it. Like, you don't need human beings to deploy an incredible radio observatory on the far side of the moon, you can do that with robotics. There's a great mission called the lunar far side telescope where you land this lander, it deploys four little rovers, the rovers wheel out wire across the surface of the moon in this giant kind of spiral pattern. And when it's done, you've got a radio telescope on the far side of the moon protected from the radiation of Earth, that is sense enough to detect say, the first hydrogen in the universe that's sensitive enough to detect the magnetospheres of extrasolar planets. There's been other ideas for radio telescopes on the moon. You know, that's the only really good reason to put a telescope on the moon is that you're protected from the radiation of Earth. If you want to have like a big telescope, you build it in space, where there's no gravity, where you can make your telescope as big as you want it to be. And you don't have to worry about gravity starting to stretch and distort the telescope. So I think it's really important to not like, we shouldn't say like, we're going to send humans to the moon, because they're going to be able be able to build a really cool radio telescope. And then if like, Oh, humans aren't going to be going to the moon anymore, too bad about that radio telescope. Like there's separate things. And, and I really think like one of the mistakes that is made constantly about justifying human space exploration is trying to tie it to some purpose. Humans have really nimble hands. And so you can send humans to do lunar science, geology, you know, robots can do that too. Right? Someone gave a great analogy that I really liked, which is that you can send your iPhone on your European holiday for a fraction of the price, and it could record audio and video and, and it could be taken into all of the places you've always wanted to go. And that's not the same as you going on a European holiday. So so the reason humans go to space is to go to space because that's what's next because that is the place that humans have to go to continue the exploration of the solar system. And even if like a human went and took no scientific gear, took no camera, no way of recording, they went to the moon, they came back and they told us about it, it would be worth sending people to the moon, because that's what's next. So we don't want to build big optical telescopes on the moons, no point. We don't want to wait for humans to build radio telescopes on the moon, we can just get going on that. And we don't want to tie human space exploration to any tangible purpose. Because the second someone has an argument with that goal, then it makes it seem like there's no point and yet we we'll want to do it anyway. All right, those are all the questions that we had this week. Thank you everyone for watching. Don't forget to vote. 
put in the name of the Star Wars planet that you are interested in, which was the best question, and we will count them up and we will celebrate the winner next week. All right. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you next week. If you want to stay on top of all the important space news, join my weekly email newsletter. I send it out every Friday to more than 55,000 people. I write every word, there are no ads, and it's absolutely free. Subscribe at universetoday.com slash newsletter. You can also subscribe to the Universe Today podcast. There you can find an audio version of all of our news, interviews, and Q&As, as well as exclusive content. Subscribe at universetoday.com slash podcast, or search for Universe Today on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. A huge thanks to everyone who supports us on Patreon and helps us stay independent. Thanks to all the interplanetary researchers, the interstellar adventurers, and the galaxy wanderers. And a special thanks to Josh Schultz and Andrew M. Gross, who support us at the Master of the Universe level. All your support means the universe to us.